for a second hymn, hymn five, 520, 520, redeem. And we'll sing the first and the last verse, 520. Huh? 521, I mean. I was okay. <laughs> Still, it's the same, but... Thank you very much, Verdi Flores. Now I got your attention, amen? All right. I'm going to see if I can't throw you a little curve this morning. One of the real joys of having uh, men like Dr. Wallace here and others here uh, is that we get fed, and it's real special. But it makes it an extra special challenge for me as I'm doing a certain series of messages. Uh, Sometimes I get a little bit behind and I start thinking, I'm not even going to finish this, if Lord willing, if if we finish out the year together. So I have kind of packed a few uh, extra messages into Sunday school uh, for the for the reminder of the remainder. I got a little bit of an echo. I know. I know you're working on it, brother. Uh, the remainder of this this month, uh, so you're not only going to think it's evening, you're going to think it's Wednesday evening because we are in Mark, just as we are in Mark on Wednesday night, and uh, it's easy to, to, to kind of continue along because we're going through uh, the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, Mark according to Uh, Jesus, according to Mark, is actually the title of the series. And so this is going to help us catch up just a little bit. And, you know, you don't have to worry too much because, you know, folks who make it on Wednesday night are also folks who make it on Sunday morning. Amen? Thank the Lord for that. And so uh, anybody who doesn't have to make it, they can sure get caught up. You can always get caught up because we also have notes and we have, uh, we, not only do we live stream everything that we do, but we also archive All of the messages from this pulpit uh, on our uh, YouTube video, so that helps for sure. So if you would, I would encourage you to turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Now that probably means we have uh, had five messages, or this will be the fifth message from, from the Gospel of Mark. And let's begin by looking at verse 34, Mark chapter 5. Verse 34, and he said unto her, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole, go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now you can break that down and take uh, what applies to you right now, and I can tell you this, one thing for sure, whenever... The Lord makes a statement, you can pretty much count on it. No, you can 100% for sure count on whatever he has to say to be the truth all the way. Uh, You can, for lack of a better term, bank on it for sure. Amen? And so here we see one, conquering fear. 
Who conquers fear? Well, Jesus does. That's because the one that we're talking about is Jesus. A major role of the servant in the Grecian world was to care for children of the master. The passage of scripture under consideration portrays Jesus as the servant of God given over to the task of conquering fear in the lives of believers. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus, one of his uh, most precious ways of being addressed was that he was the son of man. He considered himself, he is our master, he is God in human flesh, but he also considers himself a servant. What a great idea. That may be how we ought to uh, approach our lives and our ministry and our opportunity to serve the Lord. We are to be servant uh, leaders, if you will. We're to be ambassadors for Christ and we're to be servants. Notice Jesus and his followers were on a mission that took them through the country of the Gadarenes, then to Decapolis and back across the Sea of Galilee. You know, I don't know about you, but if you trace all of this down, and some of you have maps in the back of your Bible, don't you, that already have many different journeys. Paul's journeys are obviously uh, the most well-recorded, well-known as far as uh, maps are concerned. Uh, they were confronted with the awesome fear of demon possession, physical death, and an incurable illness. You say, well, that's pretty amazing stuff. I mean, these kinds of things don't happen. And today, may I tell you, if you speak to missionaries today from across the way, they'll tell you more about demonic possession and oppression than you might want to hear or acknowledge or recognize. Matter of fact, some missionaries are not too sure about going too deep into this because, you know, we don't want to sound, you know, hocus pocusy or anything like that. But, uh, hey, listen, do we believe in the Lord? Yes. Do we believe in heaven? Yes. Do we believe in hell? Yes. Do we believe in the devil? Yes. Do we do believe in demons? We sure do. And so, uh, while we look at every situation uh, as a possible physical problem or some other type of a problem, it can still also be, for sure, uh, a demonic problem. And so, when we have all of this recorded scripture for us talking about um, demonic possession and physical death, well, we're still all, last time I checked, they haven't cured that yet, have they? <laughs> Physical death is still something that happens, no matter how smart we think we are. And incurable illness. Isn't it amazing that in the year 2018, almost 2019, in the 21st century, you still uh, have no cure for the common cold? <laughs> as smart as we think we are, right? Uh, I mean, we can sure load ourselves up with a lot of medicine and mask some of the symptoms, but uh, viruses and, and illness is still something that's with us for sure. So consider this. If Christ could conquer fear in these areas, and he can, right? Uh, he could be victorious in any endeavor. You see, I think it's important that we understand that the greatest cure, uh, the greatest miracle of all, is salvation. And if the Lord can save you, don't you think he can do everything else? And that's what he's doing here. He's conquering fear. And, and the conquering of fear is important for the Christian to understand. He conquered fear. He showed them that he did it. And he recorded this for us so that we might have our fears conquered. First and foremost, the most important decision of your life is to say yes to Jesus. Trust him as your savior and let him do that miracle. And then trust him for the rest of your life in every area of your life. And so notice... It's all broken down. That's why it's, 
it's important to study the Word of God. Because when you go through Scripture expositorily, verse by verse, you see how it's all woven together, isn't it? Notice, the fear of the demoniac. The fear of the demoniac. Let's notice uh, chapter 5. Look with me, verse 2. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself. Notice that, cutting himself with stones. How amazing is it that in the 21st century, we have preschoolers cutting themselves today. I, you know, a lot of what we might have even thought we had to deal with in high school, kids are dealing with in grade school. So, so, some of what we see happening today may not necessarily be a, well, it can, it can be a, a blend, of course, but let's recognize that there might be more demonic activity taking place in the world today than we are willing to appreciate. And, you know, just as the jail preacher said, yes, right. We know that when we go into the jails and we preach to these guys, they'll tell you that you don't have to convince them for sure. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. I still just love the way as messed up as this guy is, he got it more than most of us get it, right? What did he do? But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and he didn't jump on him. He didn't act crazy. He didn't go nuts. He ran and what did he do? And worshiped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment, torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of him, thou unclean spirit. Of course, our God, discerning completely what the issue is, uh, speaks directly to the issue, doesn't he? And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now... There was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. You almost think this might have happened in Texas, you know. We've got a pretty popular, pretty big uh, feral hog population in this part of the country for sure. And all of the devils besought him. How about that? And all of the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith, Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a deep place into the sea where uh, they were about 2,000. 2,000 and were choked in the sea and they that f uh, fed the swine fled and told it to the city and in the country and they went out to see what it was that was done and they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion city and clothed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Isn't this amazing? He's okay now. He seems normal. And now we're afraid. <laughs> you know, when you're used to somebody being a nut, it kind of throws you a little bit, doesn't it? And then notice verse 16. 
And they saw it told them. Uh, let me do that again. And they that saw it told them how it befell him, uh, befell to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. By the way, you see the word pray used here? Pray means what it means. It means to plead, doesn't it? I pray thee. We see this often uh, from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. And when it was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit, Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home <clears throat> to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. You know, if the Lord has compassion for somebody who's demonically possessed, he demonstrates to us that, that uh, he would not that even one would perish. Amen? And then notice verse 20. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Well, there you go. We've already gotten 20 verses, or actually 18 verses, 19, because we read verse 34 once uh, this morning. The fear of the demonic. The fear of the demonic. Now, we often as preachers say this, if this applies to you, receive it, amen? <laughs> I don't think there's anybody here that's demonically possessed. But may I ask you a question? Can Christians be bothered by demons? Yes, they can. They can be demonically oppressed. They can be pressed down and, and, and pushed upon, I believe, with all my heart. I do not believe that they can be possessed because greater is he that is in you than is in the world. Amen. Thank the Lord for the Holy Spirit of God residing in you. But we need to know about demonic activity so that we might combat demonic activity with the Word of God. And we need to recognize that, that being saved is the most important decision that you'll ever make. But it doesn't mean that Satan is through with you. That's for sure. Fear. Fear removed. Fear soared in four directions in the experience with the gathering demoniac. First, other people feared the one possessed by demons. They sought to to chain him for their own protection. Boy, that didn't change much over the centuries. And even today, we can find places where people are treated, you know, very harshly because they don't know anything, they don't know what to do, for sure. Uh, he, was be, he, he was beyond human help. No men could tame him. And uh, second, the, the man feared himself. Uh, he was continually hurting himself. He was cutting himself. Uh, this is a perfect of analogy of what sin causes. Sin causes us to self-loathe, to, to hate ourselves. And we may not even say it publicly, but we feel it. We're thinking, how come I continue to do these things and I, and I can't stop? You know what it must be like for somebody in this man's condition to, uh, to not have the power to overcome what's happening to him? They were afraid Jesus was going to torment them. Uh, fourth, after Jesus sent the demons into the swine, into the hogs, the people in the surrounding area were afraid of his power. They had never seen anything like this. Now, I, I've read this, you've read this, and we've reviewed this, and we're, we're not even sure why all of this happened the way it did, but this is what took place. And can you just imagine what it must have been like to, to have witnessed all of that? Perhaps, I don't know, they feared uh, that the loss of their herd was, was God's judgment and that, it, it, uh, that he would do more. He could, he could have... 
sent the, the demons into them. <laughs> so it was a pretty crazy time for sure. And then we see forces involved. Uh, two powers were involved. The force of evil in legion. And by the way, legion, uh, if you're looking for biblical names, I don't recommend legion uh, for any of your children. It really does. It, it doesn't necessarily, the word itself, mean uh, demons, but we refer to it as demons because it means many. And, and notice it says um, that, that these demons were, were, were more than one or two or, or just a few. And then we see fierceness involved. Jesus caused the demons to leave the victim and go into the herd of uh, swine. Uh, they were destroyed when they ran down the steep hillside and into the water and drowned. I'll tell you what, that was a real bad day for the pigs. I just got to say, you know, <laughs> that wouldn't have been a good day to be a pig. I'm just thinking. Uh, when the news of this reached the local town, a group, probably owners of the pigs, the hogs, uh, begged Jesus to leave the area. You know, you're kind of fooling with our economy just a little bit here. Here we see faith involved. The cured man was so overwhelmed with thanksgiving that he wanted to forsake all and follow Jesus. What did he want to do? He wanted to do what happens when you get saved. He had turned from, from the world and he had turned to Jesus Christ and he wanted to follow Jesus. But Jesus felt that the man would be more effective as a witness in his own hometown. That's right. Get saved and be a witness right where you're at. And let the Lord use you there for sure. I mean, what a witness. That's the guy. That's the crazy man. That's the one we used to lock up with in chains. And he would cut himself. Now he, he, he's, he's totally different. Secondly, and this is what we do when we go through the Bible expositorily, where we're going to join Passages together, we see the fear, <clears throat> the fear of the ruler. Look with me, verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship into the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. You know what I love about joining scripture together is you go from from one scene to the next. I mean, you talk about a fast-moving ministry. That's the way those three years of public ministry were for Jesus. Notice verse 22. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, and I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him. I mean, as you read this account, you have to be amazed at what's taking place here. First of all, we see fear involved. Jesus encountered one of the rulers of the synagogue who had a very sick child. This father pleaded with Jesus, saying his daughter was dying. There's nothing uh, more piercing and painful than, than a parent's pain when their child uh, may be dying or is in pain. Uh, his fear became a reality when he received news of the child's death. I got to tell you, you know, sometimes we're pretty much told there's nothing that can be done. This is the way it is. I think we just need to continue to look to the Lord and pray and pray through whatever uh, might be taking place. We see uh, force involved. All the power of physical death stalked this scene. I mean, dead is dead, right? 
uh, this same ominous force haunts mankind today. Uh, but the might of Jesus Christ was also present, and he is present today. You know, many of us, we'll, we're called upon to go and pray for somebody who might be sick. Isn't it amazing how people at work won't have much to do with you until, until they're going through something? And maybe last week they were kind of joking and uh, around the water cooler, almost kind of snickering and making a little bit of fun of you until they're in need. And then suddenly, guess what happens? They start looking to you because there's something about what you have said to them in the past about your faith in Christ that begins to pierce their heart. Amen? Isn't it always important for us to be forgiving so that we might be positioned to help somebody along the way who might have not been so friendly uh, not too earlier? That's the way it really works. And here what we see is faith, faith involved. When the heartbroken father received the news of his daughter's death, there was the temptation to give up hope. And this hasn't changed today. When we're given bad news, we just take it and think, well, there's nothing else that can be done. Jesus sought to banish his fear and instill faith in his soul. He wanted this man to see what he could do. Only a word from Jesus Christ would comfort a broken heart in this situation. You know, the real truth is, we get to a place where we go, well, there's nothing else that we can do but play. There's no one that can help but Jesus. Well, the real truth is, we would all be better off if we began with prayer, began trusting Christ, and look to him. Hey, look, take your... Uh, uh, take care of your situation, go to the doctor, uh, eat healthy, do the right things, but trust the Lord all the way, but do it early on. It shouldn't be a last resort. How can we as Christians say what we hear others say? Well, I guess we might as well just, you know, pray. Matter of fact, we even say, well, we should just give it to the Lord. And we almost say it like, oh, we should just give up. <laughs> No, how about we start out that way? Start out looking to the Lord. You know, we, we have a pretty large list of people who pray for you when you text me and ask for prayer. You don't get to see all the responses. I'm the one who gets to see all the responses to people who are praying for you when you ask for prayer. You say, well, I didn't realize that. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for prayer more often. Well, more importantly, the Lord hears your prayers. And the Lord hears the prayers of all of those who are praying for you. Can I just tell you something? We uh, have overcome fear because our Savior is victorious. We are victorious. Freedom. Freedom involved. Jesus immediately rebuked the professional mourners at the home of Jairus. Uh, he then freed the child from the clutches of death and commanded that she be fed. Can I tell you what happens when you're, when you're healed? You're hungry. <laughs> Your body, that's one of the best evidences. Uh, Sheila was, has been taking care of her father and he has been going through some tough times. And when she knew he was doing better was when uh, he suddenly kind of uh, got his appetite back and got interested. And when he asked, uh, you know, how the Senate race was going in Texas, we knew that he was okay. All right. <laughs> and uh, we were happy to report pretty good news there. But the truth is uh, our body uh, is a is an energy burning machine and when we're doing better then we're ready to receive fuel and that was exciting for her for sure and so here we see the fear of the woman the fear of the woman look with me verse 25 this is an amazing block of scripture no doubt Verse 25, and a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had 
spent all that she had and was nothing bettered. Ever feel that way, that nothing is bettered? (laughs) But rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, uh, came in the press behind him and touched his garment. You know, there are beautiful uh, theatrical representations of this uh, moment. There are beautiful hymns that are written about this moment. But if I could but just touch the hem of his garment, I have confidence that I'll be saved. How about that? Notice, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Can you imagine the, just the, the relief and the release of all of her anxiety? And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in, his, in the press and said, who touched my clothes. Now I want you to think about this moment. All of these people pressing upon the Savior. He doesn't miss anything, does he? He asked the question for a reason because he he always knows the answer to every question that he'll ever ask for sure. And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Well, here again, this is an issue of fear, isn't it? Fear involved. A woman who was hopelessly ill, not helped by doctors, reached out to to just touch Jesus' cloak in the press of the crowd. Trembling with fear, she fell at his feet when he asked who had touched his clothes. You know, we learn a lot about worship when we see how people react to the Savior when the Savior touches them. Do people see that in us? Do they see that kind of worship in us? Are we, are we reacting to what Jesus is doing in us? You talk about a witness. Faith involved. The text declares that when the woman heard of Jesus, how about that? You know, there's a lot of noise abroad about, about this one Jesus. Uh, she came in the press behind and touched his garments. I think this is way more significant than we might think. Her faith rested totally on what she had heard other people say about him. She was responding to testimony. She was responding to someone else's witness. She had not seen it yet herself. Her faith led her to touch his cloak. Now, who knows? Maybe it didn't necessarily have to happen that way. She made up her mind that that's what she needed to do. And when we're witnessing, we see people who have a bent towards the Lord. They want to know, but they don't know what they want to know. They don't know what to do. That's where you and I come in. We're to tell them the truth. We see forces involved. When the woman touched Jesus' clothes, he felt the force of his power leave him. Now, the language that we use here, it, it could be misunderstood. May we be as clear as clear can be. Jesus is he who knew no sin. He had to know no sin because he became sin for us. Amen? Uh, I'm not qualified. Uh, Brother Abel, you're not qualified. As much as you love your family, you can't can't pay for their sins. Only Jesus can. And so 
This was, this was a force of his power. This was something that he sensed and he felt. I think it was just the healing power of Jesus. He could feel himself moving into her. She was healed. She wasn't kind of healed. She wasn't a little bit healed. They didn't walk away and think, well, she might be healed. It wasn't like, well, if you'll pay me, uh, you know, a hundred dollars, then she's healed. No, she's healed. <laughs> Can I just say this? We need to get back to a place where we believe that's the way the Lord works. Should the Lord decide to do so? He can intervene in any situation and he can turn any circumstance around. But just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even if he doesn't rescue us, we're going to trust him. We're going to worship him. Amen? Jesus' holiness contained a power within itself. The holiness of God is what touched this woman. Uh, the, the overwhelming mercy, look again. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole. What a, don't you love the word whole? Uh, we use the word well. You know, be okay. No, you're not going to be okay. <laughs> you're going to be whole. How many like whole better? I like whole. Give me whole. That's better. The Lord sent the woman away in peace, healed of her plague. Complete peace, full peace. No more fear. Because now that she has placed her trust in Jesus Christ, she can truly fear not. You see, faith in the person of Jesus Christ relieves one of fear and extends peace to take its place. How about you and I? Have we kind of dwelled a little bit too long in the area of fear? Maybe it's in our finances. Maybe it's our own physical health. Maybe it's the health of loved ones. You and I know that ultimately the greatest healing of all is really... And this one isn't always easy to receive, but it really is true. And the older you get, the more you appreciate this. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen? I'm, I'm here to tell you, I'm looking forward. I really am. As much as I love you all, <laughs> when the Lord takes me out of here, I'm just, I'm not going to say hasta luego, because I'm not coming back. Now, I will be able to say that because you're coming up. Amen? But the real truth is, God is the one who can erase fear. And our testimony, our witness that, that our confidence and our peace comes in this truth is what this lost and dying world needs today for sure. Amen? Just a great, great study. And you say, well, I didn't get enough of Mark. Make sure you're back tonight. Because tonight we're going to look at the next chapter, and I'll just give you this for free. If you read ahead, you'll even get more out of it, amen? Come on back tonight. We'll be in chapter 6, and uh, boy, there's a, <laughs> I have just been enjoying studying this week. It has been such a, thr you know what the thrill is? Preachers get to do this. We get to study this, and we get to bring it, but we get to receive it, amen? Let's look to the Lord. Father, I do thank you for Sunday school. Thank you for this sweet time, and thank you for each and every one here, Lord. Help us to Recognize that you're the one that conquers fear. You are the fear conqueror. Let us know that, appreciate that. Let us appropriate that. Let us apply that. Let us be a witness and a testimony to that. Just as this precious woman for 12 years suffering was told that you need Jesus, and that's where she went, and all she thought she needed to do was but touch the hem of his garment and that she would be made whole. And I'll tell you, there's many more who don't demonstrate that kind of faith. Can we demonstrate that kind of, kind of faith, Lord? Help us to see this. Help us to get this. Help us to uh, let this sink in this morning. And Lord, we pray that you'll have your way and continue to have your way with us even uh, in the next hour. We pray in Jesus' precious name, amen and amen.
All right, we will see you in just a little bit.